Ever increasing faith. Evidence, just your life showing up evidence. With pastor and teacher evidence. Frederick K. Price. Evidence, who can put you away? Evidence, evidence, do you need it all? Evidence, 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 what does your life say? Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, praise God for another day, and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. Turn in your Bible to Mark's gospel, chapter 11. Mark's gospel, chapter 11. Now we have been teaching for the last several sessions from the subject, how faith works. How faith works. And we have been dealing with the fundamentals of faith, of the operation of faith. Now we have pointed out in lessons before the importance of faith. For the Bible tells us the just shall live by faith. The Bible tells us, for by faith are we saved. The Bible tells us that without faith it's impossible to please God. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. The Bible says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so faith is very important. And it is essential that we understand how it operates so that we can operate in it. Because it is, the, it is faith that moves the hand of God. God is not moved by your tears. God is not moved by your crying. God is not moved by your belly aching. God is not moved by your whining. God is moved by faith. Your, your sympathy will not move the hand of God. God is a faith God. Our Heavenly Father is a faith God, and He operates and moves on our faith. So we need to understand how faith works so that we can know that we 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 are in fact operating in faith. Now in our last lesson, I think we pointed out very graphically and clearly the difference between faith and belief. Remember that faith is not belief and belief is not faith. They are two sides to the same coin and both of them are important, but one without the other will not work. Faith is acting on what you believe. It is not enough to believe something. You have to act on what you believe in order for what you believe to affect your life in a personal way. You see, a lot of Christians think that all they have to do is believe certain things and that they will automatically work. Well, you can believe that God can supply your need, but you can go with your needs unmet. You're not going to get your needs supplied simply because God can do it. You will only get it because you exercise your faith and claim the promises of God, and that's what causes the hand of God to move on your behalf. Now, we gave you a story last time, and we showed you very graphically that faith and belief are not the same thing. You see, you can believe that eating food will keep you from starving to death, but if you don't eat, you'll still starve to death, and there won't be anything wrong with what you believed. But you see, until you act on what you believe, what you believe will never affect your life in a personal way. You can believe that drinking water will keep you from dying of thirst. But if you don't drink water, you will die of thirst. It's true that if you drink it, you won't die of thirst. But if you don't actually physically drink the water, you can believe that. And even what you believe can be true, but you can still die from thirst. How many of you understand that? So faith is, I think the simplest definition that I can give you is that faith is acting on what you believe. Now you have to believe it, that's true. You start out with the believing, but you don't stop there. You have to go on to act on what you believe. And it is the acting on what you believe that causes what you believe to affect your life in a personal way. Do you follow what I'm saying? See, a lot of people believe that God can heal, but they don't get healed. And they think that because they don't get healed, that that means it's not God's will for them to be healed. Now they know God can if he wants to, but they're really not sure if he wants to. And so they're waiting on God to do it. If he does it, then they will conclude from that that it is his will. But if he doesn't heal them, then they conclude from that that it's not God's will. When in fact, it's not a matter of God, it's a matter of us. God has already made his word plain to us. The Bible already tells us that it's not his will that any should perish. 
The Bible already tells us that with Jesus' stripes, we're healed. Well, if we're healed with Jesus' stripes, then that must be God's will. And then it must be God's will that I be healed. But until I claim that promise, until I begin to speak that word based on the written word of God, then that healing power will never be effective in my physical body. It's not up to God whether I get healed. It's up to me. Amen. See, we've been coughing out with that stuff about, well, it might not be the will of God. And I'm just waiting on the Lord. Whatever the Lord wants to do, it's up to him. Yeah, you're going to end up pushing some daisies up too if you wait on that because it's not God's problem whether you're healed or not. It's yours. So faith is acting on what you believe. Now here in Mark chapter 11, Jesus enunciates what I pointed out to you before as the prayer of faith. This is the mechanics. This is how it works. This is how you activate your faith. Now in Mark 11, 24, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. See, you have to believe that ye receive them, and then that's what causes them to come. Now, he didn't say, know that you receive them. He didn't say, feel like you receive them. He didn't say, understand that you receive them. He didn't say, see that you receive them. He just simply said, believe it. Well, you say, well, how can I believe something, Brother Price, that I can't see? Well, you do that all the time, as I've pointed out. You take men at their word all the time, every day. You take the milk company at their word. They say that this is homogenized grade A milk. And so you take it home and you drink it down. You never take the time to have it analyzed by a chemist to see if there's anything in it that will kill you. You took their word, it's milk, and you drank it down without examination. In other words, you just took what the milk company said. You believe that what they said on that carton of milk was that, in fact, milk. And you accepted it. You get on an airplane and the, and the air, airline says that this flight number so-and-so leaving at such and such a time is going to such and such a city and you get on there with all your little personal belongings that may be all the stuff you own in the whole world down there in the cargo hatch of that airplane and you get on that plane and you buckle your seatbelt you haven't even seen the pilot it may not even be a pilot up there it might be a drone radio controlled airplane but you trust in the airline company and the plane takes off and after a while a voice comes on and the pilot says we are now traveling at 600 miles an hour ground speed at an altitude of 39,500 feet and we are now headed to towards New York. Man, they may be taking you to Russia to the salt mines in Siberia. Uh, because you can't tell when you get up there 39,000 feet up in the sky, and especially if it's night, you don't know whether you're going north, east, south, or west, honey. But you're trusting the word of the airline. You are taking them at their word without any evidence other than what the flight schedule may say or what the person at the ticket office may say, but you actually have not seen the destination. You don't know whether you're going there or not, but you believe that you are. Why? Because that's where they said you were going. Well, if you can believe them, why can't you believe God? The principle is the same. And that's all God is asking you to do, is give him equal time. Just like you'd believe other people when they tell you something, just believe him. Just take him at his word. And it's just that simple. Take God at his word. All right, Jesus says, therefore I say unto you, what things soever, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Now this presupposes that if I do believe that I have received something, then the most logical thing that I would say with my mouth after I have prayed is, Heavenly Father, I thank you. I believe that I have received. I believe that I have it. I believe that I'm healed. I believe that my need is met. Whatever it is, whatever my desire is that I have made known unto God through my prayer, I begin to confess that and I begin to say, I believe that I'm healed. I believe that I'm healed. Now see where many people have missed it with divine healing and with faith is not being properly instructed in this. They have gone out and started, say, I started to say, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. See, they got prayed for. Maybe, maybe they were in a wheelchair paralyzed from the neck down and they sat there immobile in that wheelchair and somebody prayed for them and then they said oh I'm healed I'm healed and then they go down the street and they see a friend and they come up to the friend and they say I'm healed I'm healed praise God I'm healed and the friend said you are yes I'm healed and the friend says well get up and walk and the person said well I can't do that and the guy said why not I thought you said you're healed oh I am well get up and walk Heal people don't ride around in wheelchairs. They're up and walking around. So get up and walk. Well, I can't. My legs won't work. Well, I thought you were healed. Well, I am. Well, get up. Well, I can't. Well, you must not be healed. And then the person begins to think, 
Oh, I guess that's right. I guess I'm not healed. <laughs> well, see, where they made the mistake is that if they were healed as a physical fact, they wouldn't have to believe it. They would know it. Question, question, how many of you, how many of you believe that you are hearing me speak to you right now? Would you raise your hand, please? How many of you believe? Get your hand up. Get it way up high. How many of you believe? Well, see, we have hands all over the building. Did you raise your hand? Did you raise your hand? Well, if you did, you missed it. I mean, if you can hear my voice, you ought to know that I'm talking to you. You don't have to believe it now. You ought to know it now. Do you follow what I'm saying? See, anything that you physically have right now, physically manifested in your little hot hand, you don't have to believe it. You know it. You only have to believe and use your faith when you don't have the thing as a physical manifested commodity in your hand. And it is your faith that takes the place of the thing until the thing gets there. Do you follow what I'm saying? Anything you already have, you don't have to believe it. So some people say, well, I'm healed. Well, if you're healed, then you ought to have the physical evidence to support it. Now, sure, God said that you're healed. That's right, Brother Price. The Bible says that I'm healed. That's right. Let me ask you this. Do you believe or disbelieve the Bible? Oh, yes. Glory to God. I believe the Bible. So then what you're saying then is if the Bible says that you're healed and you believe the Bible, then you ought to say, I believe that I'm healed. Why do you believe it? Because the Bible said that I am. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? See, the Bible says that you're healed, but you don't have it yet. Not physically manifested in your body. Your body may still be physically paralyzed, but by faith, you believe what God says. So instead of you saying, I'm sick, instead of you saying, I'm paralyzed, you begin to say, I believe that I'm healed. Why would you believe that? Because God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Do you see the difference? Now, when your legs and your body are released from the paralysis, then you can say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I am Heal. How do you know? Look at my body. It proves that I'm healed. Until then, your confession should be, I believe that I am healed. Why do you believe that? Because God said that I am, and I believe God, so I believe that I'm healed. How many of you see the difference? That's a very important distinction to make. Now, notice, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when you pray, when you pray, see, not after you pray, but right at the very moment you pray. You have to release your faith the very moment that you pray. See, a lot of you wait until you get the physical evidence, then you believe it. And like I said before, it looks like after you got the physical evidence that you'd know it and wouldn't have to believe it. It's the believing that causes it to come. Because faith is the evidence of the thing not seen. Once you see it, you don't need any more evidence. Do you understand? All right, so then my confession would be, praise God, I believe that I'm healed. I believe that I'm healed. Why? God said it. I believe it, so I believe that I'm healed. Now, that's a confession of faith. It's not yet a confession of physical fact. And see, Jesus right here very plainly tells us that we don't have it yet physically because notice what he says. He says, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye what? Shall. And ye what? Shall. And ye what? Shall. Shall have is a future tense designation. If you already had it, you wouldn't have to shall have it later. So the fact that he says, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them, that means I don't have it yet. Not physically I don't. I do as a fact of faith, but I don't as a physical fact. Not yet. I don't have it yet. But I believe that I have it. I believe that I have received it. So that's what I confess with my mouth. And that's why I'll get it physically manifested because it is the confessing of it with my mouth that causes it to come. Okay? All right, now notice. He says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. All right? If you have prayed and you believe that ye have received them, 
then you know what that means? That means you can't pray for that again. You can't ask God for that again because if you ask God for it the second time, you're saying by your asking that apparently you didn't get it the first time because if you got it the first time, there wouldn't be any need to ask for it the second time. So if you're still asking for it, that means that you don't believe that you receive and that's why you ain't gonna get it and that's why you haven't been getting it. That's why I didn't get anything for 17 years as a Christian. If I got five specific prayers answered in 17 years. I don't know it. Come on. I said specific prayers. That means if I prayed for one that's red, if I don't get a red one, my prayer didn't get answered. And see, we've been copping out with that stuff about, you know, somebody prayed for, let's say they prayed for a Cadillac, and then they got a Volkswagen, and then they listened to the devil's lie and say, well, now the Lord knew best. The Lord knew that if I got that Cadillac, I'd probably stop going to church. The Lord knew that if I got that Cadillac, I probably would become world worldly. So the Lord knew that it would keep me humble by giving me a Volkswagen. Well, if that's the case, ding-a-ling, then what'd you pray for in the first place? Why didn't you just let God give you the Volkswagen? No, if you asked for a Cadillac and you got a Volkswagen, you didn't get your prayer answered. Amen. If you asked for a blue dress and you got a green dress, you did not get your prayer answered. I mean, if you went to the grocery store and you asked the man, uh, I'd like a five-pound bag of rice, and he brings you a three-pound bag of dog food, you didn't get your request, did you? Huh? And you wouldn't accept that. In fact, you would get very indignant. Didn't I tell you rice? <laughs> but you're bringing me this Gaines dog food for. And you wouldn't accept that. You'd get very indignant. Wow, wow. Now, why, would, why don't you say the same thing in the grocery store that you've been saying there at your, in your prayer closet? When the man brought you the three-pound bag of dog food, why didn't you say, well, the Lord knew that the dog food would be better for me than the rice, and so the Lord gave me the dog food. See, you laugh at that. You say, that's silly. Well, it's just as silly as if you pray for a Cadillac and get a Volkswagen. It's the same thing. You didn't get your request. You pray for a pair of white shoes and you get a pair of black shoes, you didn't get your prayer answered. Now, Jesus said right here, he said, what things soever ye desire when you pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall get them. He didn't say believe ye receive them and you shall have something else that looks like them. He said, what things wherever ye desire when you pray, believe ye receive them, them. And he said, ye shall have them. That means if you didn't get them, you didn't get your prayer answered. Do you follow what I'm saying? Everything I ask for, I get it. Everything. Everything. Everything I've prayed about in the last eight years, I get. Everything. Everything. Now, I may, now see, God in his, in his love and mercy, and because your faith is in operation, you may get more. See, in other words, I may ask for a black Cadillac, and I may get two of them, <laughs> but I won't get less than that. Do you follow what I'm saying? I won't get less. I'll always get exactly what I ask for plus but I won't get something else. Follow what I'm saying? I won't get something else. I won't get a substitute. I'll get what I prayed for, but you see the Bible says good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So I might get more of it. If I ask for $100, I might get $500. Because God is the God of multiplication, not subtraction. If I ask for 100 and I get five, I didn't get my request. As long as I got that 100, doesn't matter how much more, but if I got that hundred, I got my prayer answered. Do you follow what I'm saying? All right, now notice. He says, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. So that means I can only pray one time in faith. If I ever ask again for that same thing, I'm not praying in faith. I know. I know what you're thinking. I know you thought that what you're supposed to do, just keep on asking until you get it. Wouldn't take any faith to do that. All it would take is a mouth. I wouldn't take any faith. Just keep asking. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. I'll take all you gimme. <laughs> gimme, gimme, gimme. No. You ask one time. God is not hard of hearing. He is not senile. He does not use a hearing aid. When you ask him, he hears you. And you only have to ask once. 
And you see what that does is it, it frees you to praise him. You got more time left to praise because you don't have to spend so much time asking and saying, gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give Amen. All right, now notice. He says, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. So that means I can only pray one time in faith. If I pray twice and ask God to give me the same thing twice, that second time I've prayed, I've prayed in unbelief. And that second prayer cancels out the first prayer. And that's why things didn't work. Sure didn't work for me because I wasn't praying in faith. I didn't believe I received anything. I thought what I had to do is keep asking and keep asking until the thing physically materialized. Then once it materialized, then I, then I didn't have to ask anymore. Well, that's not faith. That's doubt. Because Jesus very plainly says, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is a liar? How many believe that he lies to you? Nobody. He's not a liar. He tells the what? The truth. So if he said, when you pray, believe you receive it, that means you're going to get it. Physically manifested. So if you are, you don't have to ask for it anymore. All you do then is just praise him and thank him that you believe you have it, that you believe you received it. I never pray but one time. Only once do I ever ask God for anything. Just once. Then after that, I'll, ask, I'll pray the prayer of thanksgiving, confessing that I believe that I have it. Do you follow what I'm saying? See, in other words, if I pray on Monday and I say, Father God, I need $500. I've got something coming up and I need $500. In the name of Jesus, I claim the $500 according to Philippians 4.19, which says, My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And that is a need, so I claim that. And according to Mark 11.24, you said, When I pray to believe I receive them and I shall have them, so I'm now praying and I believe that I receive the $500. I want to thank you, Father. I believe that I have it. That's Monday. On Tuesday, when I go to my prayer closet to pray again, I get to the end of my prayer, somewhere in the prayer, and I say, Father, I just want to remind you, I believe that I received my $500 on Monday. I thank you. I believe that I have it. Thank you. On Wednesday, I say the same thing. On Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. As I get up on Sunday, though, and I get ready to pray, there's a knock at the door. And when I go to the door, there's a man standing there, and the man hands me an envelope, and inside is $500. So when I go to my prayer closet on Sunday, I say, Father, I just want to thank you. I have it now. That's the end of that transaction. See, each, once I pray, Lord, I believe I receive that, every other prayer relative to that subject matter should be, I thank you, Father, I believe that I have received. See, I, I'm saying I believe I already have it. Now, when it physically manifests, then I can say, thank you, Father, I now have it. That's the end of the transaction. I go on to something else. How many of you see that? Can you see that? Oh, and I tell you, it works. It works. All right, now turn to 1 John chapter 5. That's the first epistle of John. The first epistle of John, chapter 5. You find that on page 315. <laughs> page 315 in my Bible. Praise God. First John, chapter 5. We're talking about how faith works. How faith works. All right, now Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive. So if you believe you receive, then you don't ask for it any longer. The only prayer you ever pray <clears throat> relative to that subject is, I believe that I have received. Father, I thank you. I believe that I have received. But I don't go, see, I don't go to him on Monday and ask him, Lord, I need $500. I claim $500 in Jesus' name, I believe I receive. And then go back on Tuesday and say, Father, I need $500. I claim it in Jesus' name, I believe I receive. And then Wednesday, Father, I need $500. I claim it in Jesus' name, I believe I receive. You follow what I'm saying? See, I'm still asking him for it again. And that cancels out my prayer. I only pray once. You only have to pray one time. And you believe you receive it. Now, somebody will say, I know the critics will sit there and say, well, that just doesn't make sense. I know it. It's not sense. It's faith. Yeah, but that just doesn't seem logical to me. You write again, go to the head of the class. It's not logic, it's faith. Yeah, but I don't understand that. I know it. It's not understanding, it's faith. Faith is faith, sense is sense, logic is logic, and understanding is understanding. Dogs are dogs, and frogs are frogs. Frogs are not dogs, and dogs are not frogs. Faith is not sense, and sense is not faith. Faith is faith. Sense is sense, understanding is understanding. That's exactly why people miss it. They're trying to logically figure it out. He didn't say figure it out, he said believe you receive. Just that simple. All right, now, here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, it says, and this is the what? Confidence. And this is the what? Confidence. And this is the what? Confidence. 
Now, what does the word confidence mean? What, what, what is confidence? What is, what is confidence? When you say you're confident about something, what does that mean? You're sure about it. You're convinced on the subject. Is that right? Would you agree with that? That confidence means assurance. You're sure about a thing. There's no doubt about it. I'm sure. All right, now notice. He said, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, 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 how many things? Anything. I said, how many things? Anything. anything. You know what anything sounds like to me? Anything sounds like what things soever. Anything sounds like what things soever you desire. Anything sounds like what things soever. What things soever? Anything. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask how many things? Anything, anything according to his what? Here. He does what? Here. I said he does what? Here. He said, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask how many things? Anything, anything according to what? According to what? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Then what does he do? He what? He what? He hears, us. he hears us if we ask according to his what? Will. Well, now, even though it's not written there, we could paraphrase that and say it like this. That if we don't ask according to his will, he don't hear us. <laughs> Did you get it? That's not good English, but you got the point, didn't you? See, the book says, if, that means if I do. If we ask anything according to his will, he does what? Hear. He heareth us. In other words, then, in order for him to hear me, it is required that I ask him according to whose will? So that means if I don't ask according to his will, he don't hear me. How many of you can see that? Can you understand that? He doesn't hear me. See, the requirement is I have to ask according to his will. Now, somebody will come up and say, yes, Brother Pride, but that's just a problem. I don't know what the will of God is. Well, we, we know what you've been doing with your spare time then. You've been watching the edge of night and as the world turns. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Or maybe the Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> Would you believe Bugs Bunny? Daffy Duck? Because, see, God... All right, let me ask you, let me ask you this question. Now, now let's, I, I'm going to see how spiritual you are. Let me ask this question. Whose book is this? Whose book? The Bible. Whose book is this? It's the Word of God. In other words, would you agree that this is God's book? Yes. All right. Who actually then is speaking here? God. Would you agree with that? That this is God's book, this is God's word, and this is God, these are God's requirements. Is that right? In other words then, God is saying that if I want him to hear me when I pray, it is required that I pray according to his will. Is that right? Would you agree with that? Okay. Would you consider that that idea of having to ask according to his will, would you consider that as a rule? You know, as a law, a divine law, a divine requirement? How many of you would? All right. Let me ask you this. Who's making the rule? God. I said, who's making the rule? God. I said, who made the rule? God. Whose requirements are these, mine or whose? God. They're God's requirements. In other words, it's God then who requires me to ask him according to his will. How many of you would agree with that? God is the one that is requiring me to ask him according to his will. Is that right? Well, can't you see then that if God requires me to ask him anything according to his will so that I can have the confidence that he heard me, don't you realize that that puts God himself under an obligation to make his will available to me? Because if he requires me to ask according to his will and then he doesn't tell me what his will is, how can I know that I ask him according to his will and how can I be confident that he heard me when I prayed? How many of you understand that? You want me to run that through again? 
Anybody want me to say that again? I want you to get that because that's a divine law. It's a divine principle. You need to understand that. God is the one making the rule. He is the one that requires that if I ask him anything, I must do it according to his will. He requires me to do it that way. In other words, he's saying, this is my ball and this is my bat. You let me pitch or else I take my ball and my bat and I go home. You left in the street by yourself. Huh? This is God's rule. He's the one that says that if I ask according to his will, he will hear me. It's the same thing as saying that if I don't ask according to his will, he doesn't hear me. Well, if he requires me to ask according to his will, then he has to obligate himself to make his will available to me. It means that somewhere I can find his will. Somewhere I can know what his will is. If I can't know what his will is, how in the world could I ever ask him anything according to his will without knowing his will? And then how could I have any confidence that he heard me when I prayed? How many of you understand that? All right, now notice. He said, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he does what? He heareth us. You see, I know God hears me when I pray. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'll be absolutely factually honest with you, dear friend. There was a span in my Christian experience, in fact, 17 years of it, when I didn't know whether God heard me or not. I was a hoping and a praying that he did. And, you know, sometimes I felt like he did. I mean, I just felt like God heard me. When I got through praying, I had tears in my eyes. Oh, my heart was beating fast. I just had a good goosebumpy feeling all over. And I just knew, oh, hallelujah, I know God heard my prayer. Most of the time, I really, really wasn't sure whether my prayers went any further than the ceiling. Now, I was a hoping and a praying that God heard me, but I didn't really know. But you know what? Every time I pray, God hears me when I pray. Why? Who do you think you are? Why, I've never heard such arrogance in all my life. Why? Wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Wait a minute. Who do I think I am? I don't think. I know. I know. I'm a child of the king. I'm a son of God. Now, if I can't believe God, who am I going to believe? You. Now, he told me right here in the Word. Can you read? He said, if I ask him anything according to his will, he said that he hears me. Now, since he's made his will known to me, which is in his word, I spend a lot of time in this book to find out what his will is. And I make it a point every time I pray to always pray in line with the book. So I know that I know that I know that he hears me when I pray. Anytime I pray, God hears me. I know it because he told me what the rules are, and I always play the game according to the rule. No point in trying to make up some new rules when I've already got the rule book right in my hand. And I've already got the confidence because he tells me this is the confidence that I have in him, that if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. So then if I can have that confidence, I know that he heard me. Yes. All right, now notice. He said, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know, verse 15, and if we know, well, I'm just hoping that God heard me. Oh, I just felt like the Lord heard my prayer. Wait a minute. The book said, and if we what? No. I can't hear you. No. And if we what? No. If we know that he hears us. Well, Brother Price, how can you be sure that God heard you? Read verse 14. He just said, if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. That's how I know, because God said it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. <laughs> All right, now notice. He said, and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask whatsoever we ask. You know what whatsoever sounds like? Whatsoever sounds like anything. Sounds like what things soever you desire. Sounds like ask what you will. Doesn't it? Saying the same thing. All right, he says, and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, 
whatsoever we ask, we know that someday in God's own good time, according to his will, if he can ever get around to it in his busy schedule, there is a chance that we just might get it. Is that what it says in your Bible? What? No. Huh? No. What? No. It doesn't say that in your Bible? No. Oh, let me see. Let me read this again here. Oh, yes, I see where. Oh, yeah, I see how I made the mistake. All right, listen. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we just might Someday, depending on if, if it's leap year, it, we just could get it. Is that what it says? No. It doesn't say that? No. It doesn't say that in your Bible? It doesn't? My, my, let me see if I can get around here where, oh, I see where I made the mistake. I got it. I got it. I got it. Listen to this. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have of the petition that we desired of him. It doesn't say we're going to get it. It says we what? Have. We have. We have. It doesn't say we will get. It says we what? Have. have. What part of speech is we have? Present. Present tense. Hallelujah. That means I have it now. Yeah, but I don't see it. I know you don't. Because you have it by faith, and faith is your evidence. Not the thing, but faith is the evidence. That's what the Bible says. Faith is the evidence. And what is faith? Faith is God's Word. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if God said it, that means I have it. Yes, I have it by faith. I don't have it as a physical fact yet, but I have it as a faith fact. And it is the physical fact that produces the faith fact. It's the planting of the seed that produces the harvest. Is that right? It's the planting of the seed that produces the harvest. You can have a potential harvest in the seed, but if the seed does not come in contact with good ground, and if it's not left there long enough to germinate, you won't get to harvest. All right, God's word is the seed. You remember the story of the sower? Jesus gave, told a parable, gave a parable, and he said a sower went forth to sow. And some seed fell by the wayside, and some seed fell among thorns. And finally, when he gave the interpretation of the parable, what did he say? He said, the seed is the word. The ground in which the seed is planted is the human heart or the human spirit inside you. And the way you water it is by saying, I believe I have received, I believe I have received, I believe I have received, I believe I have received. And every time you say that, you're putting a little more fertilizer and a little more water on that plant. And all the time that seed is growing. And finally, when that seed bursts forth on the inside of you, it'll cause to come to pass whatever it is that you desire. Hallelujah, that's the way it works. All right, now listen. He said, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we ask for or the petition that we desired of him. Now, if we have it, God says that we have it. We have it by faith because we have his word on it. Can't you see if you ask for it the second time, isn't that the same thing as saying you don't have it? Huh? I said, if you ask him for it again, isn't that the same thing as saying you don't have it? Because if you really had it, you wouldn't have to ask for it the second time, would you? Now, I know what happened. I know what happened in your mind. Your mind went click, tilt, reject. Because somebody said, yes, Brother Price, but what about the story about the man knocking for the bread? What about the story of the unjust judge and the widow? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. And let's knock a hole. Let's punch a hole in the balloons of some doubt. Because I know in Sunday school and other places you've always heard, well, the Bible says that the man came and he knocked on the door for some bread and he, and he importuned. And the Bible says that if we have importunity, importunity, we just keep asking and 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 finally, finally one day God will give it to us. And, he, and even some Bibles in the translation 
or down at the, in the footnotes or in the center reference in certain Bibles by certain men who put Bible texts together and they'll comment down there and it'll say, well, we just keep asking the Lord and we ask and we ask and we ask. And the, and the book says that the asking is in the continuous sense. And so it says, ask and keep on asking. Well, that may be true. Sure, you ask and keep on asking, but that does not mean you keep on asking for the same thing over and over again because if you do ask for the same thing over and over again, it would contradict Mark 11, 24 and 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Hmm? All right, what do, the, what do the stories mean? Very simple. See, what happened, people have taken some of these stories in the Bible and they have thought that what God was trying to show us is that's the way we're supposed to do something. And sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes what the Bible is trying to show us is a relationship. It's comparing things for us and giving us an illustration. It's not always telling us that's the way you do it. All right, let's look at this story in the 11th chapter <clears throat> of Luke because it bears on this idea of how many times do you ask God for something? Now, you see, I said you only have to ask once. And I got it from Jesus because when he said in Mark 11, 24, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. To me, that's saying I only need to ask him one time because I already have his word on it. He told me I shall have it. Well, if I ask him for it again, that's like slapping him in, slapping him in the face, say, you a liar. I'm not going to get it because I asked once. I'm going to just have to keep on asking until I get it. He said, I shall have it. And then 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have. We know we have the petition that we desired of him. Well, if I ask for it again, I'm saying I must not know that I have it because if I had it, I wouldn't have to ask the second time. How many of you understand that? Now, we're dealing with divine principle, divine law, how faith works. All right, now watch. Luke chapter 11, verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Now let me stop right there a minute and let me define that word importunity. Because unfortunately, only one aspect of that word has been usually presented. And that is the idea of a persistence in asking. Now the word importunity does carry with it the meaning of and the connotation of continuing to ask. But there is another aspect of it and that's the aspect I think that is the most important part in this story and that is that importunity also means as it's used in the Greek New Testament it means an unashamed asking. It means asking without any shame, without any reservation. It means an unashamed asking. Having no shame, no reticence, about asking, having a feeling of right, a right to ask with no shame, no hesitation. It does mean persistence. That's a part of it, but that's not all of it. And I believe in this story, the most important part of it is not the persistence aspect of the word importunity, but the aspect of an unashamed asking. Now, you'll be able to see it in just a moment. Now, verse 9. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall what? Knock and it shall be opened unto who? You. For how many people ask? Everyone. For everyone that asketh does what? Receive. And he that seeketh what? Fine. And to him that knocketh it shall be what? Open. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that what? Ask Him. All right, now here's what I want to ask you. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be honest before God. How many times do you think you have to ask God for the Holy Spirit? Boy, that was a quick answer. <laughs> That was a confident answer. How many times do you have to ask God for the Holy Spirit? Once. Oh, come on. You got to ask him at least seven times, don't you? No. Eight? No. Nine? No. Fifteen? No. How many times? Once. How many of you are convinced that you only have to ask God one time for the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand. Come on, come on, come on. How many times? Once. 
Well, now, I thought the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. The Bible says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, why would he require you to ask only one time for the Holy Ghost, but 19 times for your healing? Would you please tell me that? If you only have to ask once for the Holy Spirit, why do you have to ask him 19 times for a job? Why do you have to ask him 15 times for finances to pay your bills? But that's exactly what people have been teaching us, that you just keep on asking and keep on asking and keep on asking and keep on asking. Finally, you wear God down and he'll finally give, it in, give in to you to get rid of you. That's really what we're saying. Now, here's the key in this story. What some... Bible expositors have done is that they have they thought that what Jesus was showing us here was a way to pray and that is persist and keep on asking that's not what he's showing us at all he's showing us a relationship and it's very obvious when you get down here to the 11th verse because he says he compares it and he says if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father will he give him a stone now remember a while ago I told you that if you asked for a Cadillac and you got a Volkswagen you didn't get your prayer answered notice what Jesus says how many of you that would ask that's a father who has a son that would come to him and ask him for a fish would give him a stone huh well he wouldn't would he well neither would your heavenly father if you ask him for a Cadillac give you a Volkswagen same thing now what is the story trying to show us a comparison now here's the setting here was a man that came to another man who was no more to him than a friend we have no biblical account that this was an employer with an employee we have no biblical account that, we, that this was a man who was related in any way to the man on the inside just a friend and the man came at midnight an unearthly hour and he asked his friend for bread. He came up on the porch at midnight, perhaps knocked on the door, said, hey, John. John said from within, who's that out there knocking on my door? It's Bill, John. Man, what you doing out here this time of night? Hey, listen, man, some folks just drove in from Riverside and the stores are closed and I don't have any bread. Will you get up and give me some bread for my friends? And he said, oh, baby, come on, we're in the bed, man. The kid's in the bed, the dog's asleep, the goldfish is eating up the canary, or the canary's eating up the goldfish. I mean, man, we in bed, I can't get up and give you no bread. And the guy just kept on, said, oh, come on, man, come on, man, give me some bread, will you? I gotta have some bread, man. These folks are waiting at home, they're hungry, and I don't have anything to set them on. Oh, come on, man, please give me some bread. And our people driving up and down the street said, what's that ding -ling doing out there knocking on that door at midnight? But the man was unashamed. He said, that's my friend inside. I got a right to talk to my friend. And it didn't shame him at all to stand there and knock on that door and ask for that bread at midnight. And finally, the man on the inside said, man, you're going to drive me crazy. He said, honey, get up and give that dude some bread because if we don't give him some bread, he's going to keep us up all night. All right, now here's the point of the story. Jesus is showing you a relationship. He is saying, in essence, that if one man could come to another man who is no more to him than a friend, not a relative, not an employer or an employee, he didn't have a covenant, he didn't have a contract, there was nothing to bind the two men together. If this man could come to his friend at midnight, and if he could get what he wanted from his friend for no other reason than he persisted unashamedly in knocking on that door and asking for that bread, if he could get it by doing that to a man who's no more than a friend to him, how much more can you expect to get it from your heavenly father when you got a blood covenant signed in the blood of Jesus and you have a right to it? Do you see it? Do you see it? That, he's not showing us how to pray. He's not saying this is the way you pray. Just keep on asking God. Keep on asking God. Bug him until you drive him nuts. Until he gives it to you just because in order to get rid of you. He is trying to show us a relationship. And he uses the same principle down here in the 11th verse when he said, If any man who is a father has a son and the son comes to him and asks him for bread, you don't give him a rock. He's showing you that if one man could get what he wanted from another man for no other reason, he didn't have a covenant. There was no blood relationship between them. Just for no other reason than the fact the man persisted unashamedly to ask. Jesus is saying, listen, you got a blood covenant. 
You got a contract. You got a New Testament. You have a right to it. And if that man could get what he wanted for no other reason than he persisted unashamedly to ask, then you can expect to get what you desire because you have a right to it. Praise God. Can you, how many of you can see that? That's what the story is showing us. Well, somebody else said, yes, Brother Pryor, but what about the widow with the unjust judge? I'm glad you asked that question. Turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke's Gospel chapter 18. Because there's another story here. And see, these things have been used to, to hinder the body of Christ. To cheat the Christian out of what rightfully belongs to him. By conning him into some kind of situation of believing that what you do, you just keep on asking God. Hey, listen, doesn't it grieve you when your child asks you, Daddy, buy me a bicycle for Christmas? Or your, your daughter asks you, buy me a Barbie doll? And you say, okay, sweetheart. That's on Monday. And then Tuesday, she comes back and asks you, Daddy, will you please buy me a Barbie doll? And on Wednesday, she comes back, Daddy, will you please buy me a Barbie doll? And on Thursday, you come, will you please buy me a Barbie doll? Six months later, every day, she's asking you, buy her a Barbie doll, buy her a Barbie doll, buy me a Barbie doll. Doesn't that kind of grieve you? Say, my God, my own child doesn't even believe my words any good. Hmm? Kind of grieves you that your child would think that you're lying to them, that they have to just keep on asking you every single day for the same thing over and over again. All right, now let's look at this story. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end. In other words, this is the purpose of the parable. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. That means that they may always use prayer as a medium of communication, fellowship, praise, and petition. That men ought always pray, not faint or give up prayer as a method of communication with the Heavenly Father. That's the purpose of this story. That men ought always what? Pray. Ought always what? Pray. Pray. Now this is the story. There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? <coughs> now listen, here is the story. Jesus said that men ought always pray. That is, use prayer as a means of communication, fellowship, petition, praise, and intercession. Don't ever stop praying. Don't ever give up praying. Use prayer. Don't stop praying, he says. And he told this story to buttress up the idea that he was trying to convey. He said there was a judge. Now, he said that the judge did not fear God. The judge did not fear man. That's a pretty hard judge, right? And the Bible says there was a widow. And the widow came to the judge and said, Hey, judge. Yeah, woman, what you want? I want you to avenge me of mine adversary. And the judge said, I ain't going to do it. Get out of my courtroom, woman. And the lady kept coming back. The lady kept coming back. The implication is that the lady kept coming back. Finally, Jesus said that the judge began to reason in himself. And he said, Man, this old woman's driving me buggy. Every time I come into the court, this woman is here pleading this case. Now, I don't fear God, and I'm not afraid of men, but I'm going to answer this widow's request and get this old woman off of my back. Now, Jesus said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. This could not be a story to show us an illustration of God and the Christian, because if it were that, then it would make the Christian the widow, and it would make God the unjust judge, and his reason for answering your prayer to get rid of you. Huh? That couldn't be the case, could it? No. No. Again, this story is telling us the very same thing that the 11th chapter said. What it is, is that Jesus was saying, in essence, here was a widow that came to a man, and Jesus is the one that called him an unjust judge. I mean, he wasn't even a straight judge, man. He was a crooked judge. Unjust. Man, what a combination to have a man that's unjust in the position of a judge. He said he was an unjust judge. And the widow came and kept pleading her case. Finally, the judge 
capitulated, gave in to the woman and said, I'm going to answer this old lady because she's driving me crazy. Every time I come into court, he's, there she is standing up there in the courtroom. Now, I don't fear God, I don't fear man, but I'm going to answer her request just to get her out of the courtroom. Now, Jesus said, now hear what the unjust judge said. And he says, now shall not God avenge his own elect? Now, what's the point of the story? The very same as the other. He is saying that if a woman who was a widow could come to a man who was unjust, unjust, didn't even fear God, wasn't afraid of mankind, but because the woman persisted unashamedly to keep on bugging the judge, the judge finally gave in to her. And Jesus is saying, if that woman could get what she wanted from a man who was an unjust judge, how much more can you get it? And you have a right to it because you're blood bought and blood washed, and you got a contract and God said, come boldly into the throne of grace and make your request known unto me. The story is showing us the fact that if they could get it that way, we can get it from our precious, loving, heavenly Father. Hallelujah. How faith works. Well, I, listen, I see my time is just about gone. And I know that you're going to want to get an audio cassette of this message and probably the other messages in the series. So don't go away because the announcement...